Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigers. Welcome back, everyone, to the Fly Culture Podcast. I'm really, really pleased today to be joined by angler, writer, TV presenter, and photographer Matt Hayes. He didn't really need any introduction. I'm sure you'll know him, but I wanted to say the many things that he's done and and hopefully we'll cover those within the podcast today. But Matt, thanks so much for dropping by and talking with me today. How are you doing? I'm fine, Pete. I'm um, holed up in Norway, not too far from the Galna River, riding out the um, the virus, et cetera, and looking forward to Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, it it's must have been an interesting one. I don't know how the restrictions and things worked over there in Norway. Did you have a lockdown as such, or did you just sort of let things go and 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 um, people were allowed to move around and and that herd herd mentality thing? Did that that work for the virus? Uh, they didn't do the herd thing in Norway. They did that very much in Sweden, where there's sort of mixed reports about whether it's worked or not over here. We did have a lockdown initially during March when the whole thing kicked off. Um, I'd actually been across in the UK at the Northern Angling Show. So I had to get back over here pretty quickly to avoid being stuck in the UK away from the family. And then we were locked down-ish for about four or five weeks. But to be honest, you know, we've got a lot of space here. So um, lockdown hasn't really affected us. Uh, Population density is low in Norway, and that's one of the reasons I think why quality of life and freedom and all that sort of thing, if you're a fisherman, is is so high. So we've had an easy ride compared to you guys, mate. We've been fine. One of the big worries was during the summer, of course, we've got a hugely international clientele here who, who come to our fishing lodge. And we were very concerned about how it would affect us. And it did. I mean, basically, we we put our UK and other international visitors, um, we put them into next year, um, into 2021, um, secured the deposits, just rebooked them. And then we sold rods on the stock market, uh, spot market, sorry, um, last year, so mainly to Norwegians. A few Danes and Swedes snuck in for a while and then things change in Denmark and they weren't allowed in. So it was quite a perilous year and one which was very difficult for anybody running fishing on the river. But um, we, we weathered that. We've, you know, we've been established as a fishing uh, lodge in this incarnation um, with myself and Anna Murray for over 10 years. Um, but of course, historically, the place has been looking after fishermen since 1882. So, um, it would have been a shame if, if something had stopped that tradition. Does that mean that you managed to get out fishing yourself? I do. Uh, not as much as I'd like. I mean, I guess everybody watching and listening to this now will probably say the same thing, because I think no matter how much fishing you get, uh, it's never enough, really. Um, but uh, as time has gone by, I've become less fixated on my own fishing and i i genuinely do enjoy seeing other people catch fish and a lot of the other things around the sport interest me such as the photography and fly tying the company um uh, you know the, the, the whole culture surrounding fishing really interests me and i get great pleasure from that and that sustains me through the dark winter months pete when uh, there's no fishing here because the river over there is frozen um, quite a lot of the time. And when it isn't frozen, it's very, very cold. Uh, fishing's three months of the year here, pretty much. That's river fishing. So um, I have to come back to the UK to go course fishing, occasionally game, game fishing. It, it's in the winter, really, that I miss the fishing the most. Um, you know, when I hear about a nice, mild winter's day i think about chub and perch in the uk or predator fishing and it hurts sometimes but i do get to go i come back fish with mick fish with my other mates and i really cherish that but in the summer i don't get to go as much as i'd like theoretically i could go every day um because i run the fishing here and it's run according to my rules but 
I don't like fishing in front of the guests. Uh, if they've got a pool coming up, I don't like jumping in in front of them. We'll probably come on to it later in terms of the way in which we run the river and in terms of salmon fishing, because it's a bit different to the norm on this river and probably generally. So I don't like to buck my own system, and it does cost me quite a lot of fishing. But um, I catch quite a few salmon each season when I, you know, so I do all right. Yeah, that's good to hear. It's interesting that you, rewinding a tiny little bit there, where you talk about, you know, it's the bigger um picture of the fishing that you really love and it's come up a few times on these podcasts and do you think that that view that you don't have to be thrashing the water to a phone i'm here i've got a fish i've got a fish do you think that comes with maturity as well yes i don't think that there can be any doubt about that i I think my enthusiasm to fish uh as as a young man middle-aged man was really unparalleled you know i mean i i had an immense desire not to compete with other people but to achieve what i wanted to achieve um and i just couldn't get enough fishing you know and and in the early days of filming the great rod race i nearly sacked the crew because they just couldn't keep up in hindsight you know um mick was by then mick's older than me so he was more slightly more laid back but it's the same with him you know he 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 goes fishing less than he used to, but he probably still goes three or four times a week, um, you know, and that's light. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I think so, mate. I, th- I think you get to the point where in the beginning you just want to catch as many fish as you can. Then you go to a stage where you want to catch big fish. And then after that, I think you reach another phase. If you fish long enough, if you fish enough, where you're more selective about how and where and why and who with you want to catch them. Um, It's just called growing up, really, and growing old, I suppose. I I look at the fishing scene as it is now, which I'm still very much part of. Um, You know, social media has been a big thing for me because it's enabled me to make a living when other people in this industry have fallen off the edges and struggled, you know. So it's not. I'm not anti-tech. Um, as someone who makes films and does a lot of photography, I, you know, I see the benefits of it. But there is a focus on the end result nowadays, um, not on the fishing itself. And the literature has suffered. The great writers, I think, that we enjoyed in the days of yore uh, are very few left now. Um, and none coming through, which is worrying. And I always found literature very inspiring. You know, if if I wanted to go and fish for roach, I'd read a book about roach fishing and it would fire me up. So I I think there's a downside to the modern technology and, and particularly with regard to digital and social, and that is you don't have to strive too hard to get anything anymore. Knowledge that took you years to achieve and was hard won is now instant as is knowledge of where everybody else is fishing so it, it, it's moving much faster i understand that um but i think there is a cheapening of of the fishing itself and the experience of learning to fish learning watercraft you know it took years and years and years to learn how to do something before we had, you know, the the modern situation. I mean, we're using technology to speak now. So I, I, I don't intend to be hypocritical, but there is a downside to it. And the downside is the, the fishing, the joy of the fishing, rather than the, hey, look at what I've caught, the five minutes of fame, and then you move on. So I, that, 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 I think, is an issue which the sport is facing. But, you know, Pete, I, I see youngsters out fishing today who, who seem to be absolutely crazy for it. But when I think back, I was just the same. And, you know, I think I'd love to be able to, to, to feel what's in their heart or what's in their fishing soul, because that's the key. You know, fishing to me has been, I think Mick put it 
really well once. I, I made um, a, a documentary of him called The Pike and I, and I filmed it. And um, I, I said to him, look, let's make a film about you because, you know, most tribute things are done when people are brown bread. And I said, you've got still got loads of life in you. Let's, let, let's go out and make this thing about why you pike fish. Let's just make this thing about Mick Brown. So I made it as a friend, and, and, and we were sitting on the bank. I was interviewing, and he said, there's part of me that needs this. Without it, I, I love my family, I love my life, but without this, I'm not quite complete. I'm not quite right. And that, I think, is something which I can agree with many fishermen do. So very long-winded answer. There's good and bad, but I'd like to peer into the souls of some of the current fishing stars to gauge their mettle. Yeah. yeah. You know, to judge, because there's every chance that they're just as enthusiastic as I was, Pete. Times have moved on, but the passion for fishing remains, I think. Yeah, I think that's beautifully put yeah, as well. And I love well. your analogy love from Mick there as well. And, and that's just absolutely hit the nail on the head, hasn't it? And being complete. And even if it's just 20 minutes on the water or walking by the water, sometimes that is enough yep. to recharge the soul, or it feels like it does anyway. You're absolutely right. I mean, you said to me, how much fishing can you do? How much fishing I do is relatively unimportant. You know, I've travelled all over the world. I've caught all sorts of fish. Of course, there's fish I'd like to catch. I want to catch a 40-pound salmon or at least land one. Um, and it's good to have outstanding ambitions. But the fact that I can go is what really counts. The fact that I can walk across the river. If I really want to, I can go and fish. That's what counts. Um, the amount of time I spend fishing is less important than the principle that I'm not I'm not a caged bird, you know. Yeah, yeah, good points. Let's take it back then, because you talked about when you were a youngster, and where did that fishing journey begin for you? Where where was it that you realised, yes, this is for me? Was that we, did you grow up? And I was similar that you played football, you played cricket, you did fishing, you did those sorts of all those other sorts of things that went with it. But when did you realise that fishing was becoming a larger part of your life? That's a really good question. Um, I th I think it it was always there when my dad took me to the water. Like I went, both of my grandfathers were fishermen. Two more different characters you couldn't imagine. My dad's dad was a bus driver. Um, loved his course fishing, and I remember trips with him. Um, he used to swear like a trooper, and he was the crudest fisherman you could imagine. My grandmother on my mum's side was a good, very, very, very good all-round fisherman. Uh, and he used to match fish, uh, but he could also fly fish. And he used to spend many, many weekends away in, in Wales, mainly fishing for sea trout and salmon. And my nan told me they used to have a caravan holiday. She said, I took vegetables, but I didn't take any meat because Dave would catch enough fish for the week, you know, sea trout and salmon. He was mustard keen and extremely good uh, at all forms of fishing. Um, but they were both great characters. I remember going fishing with them and my dad and my uncle Colin uh, from the age of probably three, from my first memories. Um, I remember going to Liso's Park in Hales Home with my dad with a tiddler net to catch tadpoles in the spring to Edgebaston Reservoir to try and catch sticklebacks. Um, water fascinated me, Pete. It, it, it drew me like like an iron filing to a magnet, and I was I, I've always been happy by water, whether it was with you know a little fishing net in my hand or moving on to rod and line. Earliest memories fishing on the canal, Staff's Worcester Canal by the Stew Pony Pub, which isn't there now in that area. Um, fishing for gudgeon. Sometimes we caught a roach. Like a six ounce roach was highlight of the day, you know, in among a hundred gudgeon. And if we fished under a tree, I can remember quite often we catch we caught a big perch. Um, I mean, I'd like to say they were a pound and a half, two pound, but that's a boy's memories, you know. Um, but 
I, I think it was instant. Um, it was like it was like giving an ad, addict, you know, crack cocaine or something. It's just bang, that was it. I, I, I went and I was hooked. And it, it, it's it's never, it's always been my my passion, my interests, everything. My life has been, you know, dictated by my passion for fishing. It, 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 it shaped my destiny. Uh, I like to think I'm putting something back now. Um, I try to be a more responsible human being. But the truth is that um, uh, I'm like a leaf on a stream that's just, I've just, you know, just drifted with the stream. I've, I've gone where it's taken me. I'm, you know, there's no, there's no doubt about that. I am where I am now because of fishing. If it wasn't for fishing, I wouldn't be here. Um, so, mate, I, can't, I just can't. I can't really answer that. I don't. I don't. I can't. I don't remember anything growing within me. I just remember this instant connection, this love, and people might think that what I've done and what Mick's done is partly driven by commercialism or Z-list celebrity, whatever. And it isn't. It never has been. That's never, ever been important to me. It's only been about fishing. And that's why you mentioned that I've changed incarnations so many times, you know, I cut my teeth and made my reputation as a course fisherman. And then I discovered particularly lure fishing, um, which I loved and still love, uh, still love all forms of very tactile, you know, sport fishing where you can feel, see, see or feel the bite, feel or seal it even. Um, and, and then along came fly fishing and I was just, I was fighting with a lack of ability, you know, the casting was terrible, but I worked on that and I practiced and I practiced and I just spent more time with a fly rod in my hand. In the early days, I got away with the lack of casting ability because I'm a good fisherman and I can get close to fish and I can see opportunities perhaps that other people can't where they sort of bumble around and there's a fish right underneath them that's there to be caught. But I used that to mask the inherent problem. And when I learned to cast, and, and I think, you know, the day came when you go out fishing, you don't even think about which direction the wind's blowing because you know it's not going to stop you. And it's, you know, as a fly fisherman, you, you'll cope with it. Um, that's, that's the day you graduated, I think. Um, and I, I mean, I, I love it. You, you know, these days, fly fishing is everything uh, to me because it, you know, you get to the stage where you want to do things uh, by the most difficult route, the, the most skillful way, if you like. Um, and for me, that's fly fishing. But the, the other peripherals around my angling career, have, they don't matter. They don't matter. I've done, you know, I've had my cake and eat it. I've followed that stream. I've immersed myself in it. I've enjoyed it to the full. I owe the, the sport of fishing a tremendous debt of gratitude because, you know, I am a compulsive character. And there have been points in my life where, you know, I've had um, battles. I don't want to over-dramatise this with, with certain aspects of my mental health. And I believe that without fishing, uh, I might not have been in quite as good a place. So I don't know, it, but I can assure you it's been nothing to do with the notoriety uh, or, or, you know, anything associated with that. I, I'm not interested in that. I never have been, and I'm not nice. now. Nice. It's been really interesting, Matt, and I know we were talking off mic as well, that, you know, I remember those programmes from the very, very early days, um, and they were the soundtrack for on a Saturday morning on Sky, my daughter and I would sit down and watch um, the programs, Total Fishing, I remember. And it was quite clear, and as someone, as an instructor as well, you could see 
your your curve of, of fly fishing move on. But what I really appreciated about it was the honesty. And you said, and I remember you fishing in one of the first series, um, I think it was in Normandy for trout, and and you were doing a little bit then, and then how it moved on. I remember you fishing in, that, yeah, in Ireland um, and doing a little bit there. And then on the Lower Itchin, which was a really lovely um one that that where Mick wanted to catch a fish on his dad's rod and all those sorts of things, but you could see that interest. And then for me, that gowler particularly, and it's it seems as you say how you followed that stream literally, and that was a really fascinating program that you you'd set on the gowler, and the fishing was tough, wasn't it? Yes, yes, and, and but but the honesty, um, I think. All the shows I've made have been about mm. honesty, but you you talk about total fishing and and watching it with your daughter. It is only now, um, all those years on, when people come up to me and say, "I grew up with you." It makes me feel terribly old. You know, the time yeah. goes like that. Um, that I've realised how in, you know how influential it was on people, and you know because. <sighs> I've always been a slightly maverick character as far as the angling industry goes, Pete, mm-hmm. truth to tell. Um, and, and over the years of my popularity, it has, it, it has bucked the trend of the industry narrative. Uh, there have been times when the ind- industry has wanted to select its own man or woman, uh, and I've spoiled that party sometimes. Um, it's about grassroots. It's about connection with people. I was tempted to say ordinary people. Nobody's ordinary. Um, but I'm talking about people who don't have the privilege of going fishing as often as I do or, you know, making a living out of it or, or attached to, you know, the angling industry in some respect. I'm talking about anglers, the length and breadth of the country. Um I'm the same as them. And when I made those programs, if I got frustrated with myself because I wasn't good enough at something, all it made me was more determined to crack it in the end, which is what actually brought me back to Gowler. Um, We made an episode of Lake Escapes. And uh, it was a series where we were going... I say we, it's not the royal we, but I had a crew of people who I worked with, you know. And we we came to Norway as part of this series, and it was short fishing breaks all over Europe. So we went to Madeira, we went to the Azores, we went to Poland, Ireland, and all over the place. One of the places we came to was Norway. Came to the Gowler, never been fishing for salmon with a double hand rod before. Uh, I think I'd only ever caught one on a single hand on the River Moy. It was the only time I tried. Um, I mean, you struggle if you're on the ridge pool and you can't catch a salmon. Um, and anyway, we, we ended up coming to the Gowler. And I remember I'd got uh, a Loomis 14 foot 9 10 stinger. And anybody know, that knows that rod will realize that it's, it's possibly one of, well, it is one of the greatest salmon rods ever made in modern times for casting but your timing has to be good. I had an uncut shooting head in the days when they needed to be cut back. Nobody told me that you've got to have the right weight and length of line. I just used it uncut, and, and, you know, I obviously couldn't cast this thing apart from overhead. So I spent two days um, up to my tits in the gala, in, and it, the water was very cold. I had a, a leak in my both uh, legs of my waders in the end. So I was freezing for two days, but I would not give in. I, I, I think I got one pull. And um, for most people, that would be enough. You know, they'd say, no more. I'm done with that. But for me, it was like red rag to a bull. And I, I resolved that I would, I would come back and I would catch a salmon from this river. But that program was typically, you know, brutally honest. Um, when when I communicate on camera with people, I, I imagine talking to people and and you can't keep fishermen, Pete. They're not stupid, most of them. They've got great instincts. 
then you know the ones that follow fishing they they they, they can spot a bull shooter a mile off and um there's no point in even trying in my in my eyes you know it's about respecting you're honest you've got to say listen i struggle with this because that's real that you know who hasn't gone out and struggled with something yeah you know uh had a bad day not able to cast you know uh, and and had someone stand next to them who's, who's a bit of a novice catch oh look, they're easy to catch you know we all had it everybody's had it so so why pretend differently <laughs> you know obviously you've got to make television you've got to make a television show if you if you're out to catch fish for the camera there is no getting away from the fact that if you regularly fail you will not get the work that's that's a fact because people's time costs money uh and and if you if you cock it up often enough you'll soon be off screen so it goes without saying that a certain level of ability is required uh, and a certain level of determination and an understanding that your job when you go and make that program is to recreate as closely as you can a normal day's fishing. And I say recreate because on a normal day, you don't get in and out the car three times before you set up. You don't walk up and down the path three times because so you can get a certain shot. You don't stand in that spot just because the light's nice there. But if you, you know, once you begin to understand making films, you do do that stuff because otherwise, when you watch the footage back, you think, "Well, that's not how I remember the day." Well, that doesn't look very good. Or, oh, no, that's, you know, so you are. Television is like that. Any film is like that. You are trying to portray what it's really like because you can't the technology doesn't exist at the moment to be able to film something beautifully enough to make it interesting in real time if you watch it in real time it looks like what it is it looks like reality tv it's one or two camera angles it's a bit rough around the edges and that may be what people want and there is a place for that but if you want to celebrate the beauty of angling and what you feel in your heart when you go fishing, you've got a graft at that. So, yes, in some ways you do recreate it. Um, the, the fishing, the actual catching of fish is, is the part that is truly spontaneous. It's the exciting part when things can, you know, you're going off, you're going off script and you're going off piste. So, you know, I, think, I hope that's a very honest answer. to Absolutely. <laughs> and do you think that series lake escapes was a tipping point for you as well from a fly fishing point of view because i remember that one really well and like you say the honesty of it as i said earlier as well was was to me really cool and then you went somewhere else since i think there may have been two places in scandinavia weren't there one where you stayed in a tent and i remember you catching trout on caddis patterns and and things like that and i think you swung one downstream to catch them which was was really cool but do you think that was the starting point for the love affair with fly fishing growing some more and also with Scandinavia too? Um, with Scandinavia, yes. Um, the love of fly fishing began really when I um, went to Cuba in the late 90s with a friend of mine, Simon Bond. And at the time, Simon and myself were working with Shimano. Simon was the marketing director. And he signed me on as uh, an ambassador. And I remember David Hall, who's uh, dead now, um, sadly. He um, he basically said, oh, you know, who is this bloke? What, you know, what are Shimano doing? And a lot of established industry figures did the same thing. With the exception, I have to say, of John Wilson, who was always extremely um, complimentary about me, encouraged me, uh, and behaved in a truly gentlemanly, professional way, for which he'll have my, always have my undying admiration. A great professional, John. 
Um, but nonetheless, you know, this character turned up that nobody really wanted to have much to do with because they could see I was going to kick some ass and upset the establishment, and I did. Um, but during that period at Shimano, we booked um, what is now quite a notorious and infamous trip to Cuba. And Shimano decided to have one of their famous sales conferences there in which they invited their fishing tackle dealers from all over Europe to go and attend this conference in Havana. Well, at that time, you know, it, it really was. You, you hear all sorts of stuff. In, I've seen it in fly fishing magazines and see people on film and stuff talking about how they really pioneered fishing in Cuba. No, they didn't. I can tell you where Cuba fishing started. It started on one day on that trip and we were sitting in the bar of the Havana um, Cahiba Hotel, beautiful hotel. And a Dutch guy walked in. Dave Lewis was there, the sea fisherman. Me, Bondi, and a few other fishing tackle dealers. And a Dutch guy who I can't remember his name walked in and he said, lads, he said, does anybody want to go fishing? I was like, yeah, we, you know, we'll go. Where, where? And he said, don't worry about that. Well, what are we fishing for? He said, uh, bonefish. Well, we didn't know what bonefish were, really. We'd, we'd heard of them. But if you'd said to me, draw a bonefish, I'd have got it half right. But it, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a proper bonefish. And we said, well, what do they eat? You know, oh, well, don't worry about that. So we piled into this bus. There was 20 of us. Most of them were Dutch. And most people, in fact, all people, nobody had got a fly rod, Pete. Nobody had got a fly rod or any flies. All we had was spinners and rapalas. And we went down to a place called Las Salinas. And it's in Matanzas. And you'd have to drive down a causeway and a bumpy old track, which goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And eventually we came to the end of this place and it's very near to the bay of pigs and at the end of it there's a hut and a mast and a group of elderly people whose job ostensibly is to watch the wild birds in the area and nature and their secondary task is to be eyes and ears because castro was still alive at that time and they were there to make sure that nobody invaded basically and shouldn't be there and they used these tiny little plastic skiffs, almost injection molded, with a, a bamboo push pole. Well, they pole started pulling us out onto this water that's about a foot to 18 inches deep. And we think, well, we're not going to be anything here, you know. All of a sudden, they start saying, Maccabee, Maccabee. And we say, oh, what's that all about? And then we saw the shoals of bonefish. And, and there were so many that people were casting Rapalas into the middle and they were just blowing out into huge showers. But that day on, on Rapalas and spinners, we caught quite loads. That's how aggressive they were. <laughs> on Rapalas, that big. Anyway, it, it, it was an amazing experience. And at that time, you'd got uh, Pepe and uh, I think it was Francesco. At, um, the, they had the operation at... Um, Hardin is done arena that was just starting up so that's where it started it was exactly at that point and anybody that tells you any anything <laughs> is bullshitting mate that's where it started and me and Simon wanted to go back and we did go back we were so inspired by it we said we've got to do this the right way you know this is you know unbelievable these fish we went back uh, within six months, within three months, with fly rods, pen, 2.5G, saltwater fly reels, still got them, absolutely bulletproof, beautiful things. We bought two or three each, uh, seven to nine weight rods. Uh, we both copped off with Cuban women um, permanently. Simon's still married to one. I was with one for a lady for a long time and we ended up getting divorced. But um, I lived on and off in Havana and around that area for the next God knows how long. We made Buena Vista yeah. Fishing Club there. 
where I didn't just go to the same old tired places. We went all over Cuba. You know, we went to Santa Clara, we went to Santiago, Santiago de Cuba, and it was magic. Um, and I ended up. I've got a letter actually from from Fidel Castro thanking me for my research into fishing wow. in Cuba. Wow, that's tourist. pretty impressive. Um, so I hear all the talk, mate, but the reality is that is where it started. And that passion for bonefish, permit, and tarpon, that is where it really ignited. But as time went by, I then began to think, uh, going with Tony and Ichtid, you were talking about those um, before we started here, talking about sea trout fishing and, I, I got interested in sea trout fishing through, really through Tony uh, Davis and Ichtid Griffiths, who you know well. And they took me and Mick sea trout fishing. Mick enjoyed it, but, you know, that was it for him. For me, no, that was a different thing. Night fishing for sea trout, which I did quite a bit of around that time. If, if People say to me, if you had one la- last day of fishing left to choose, what would it be? And, um, of course, people are disappointed if I don't say chub or something like that, or carp or something like that. But the truth is, it would probably be a night fishing for sea trout, big sea trout, uh, because it's such a sensual experience. You, you, you know, because you can't see, you have to cast by feel and sense of timing. But to feel that tug, when it comes out of the blue, and if it's a big sea trout, you you hear it turn over on the surface. And I, I just think it don't get any better than that, yeah. to be honest. Um, uh, it, it, nine, 10, 11, 12 pound sea trout in, in, in the night on a single hand rod. <laughs> I'll tell you, that takes a beating, especially on a surface tour. So um, anyway, that's that's a digression. But you can tell from from the way I'm describing this that having got that sea trout experience, you know, my grandfather loved migratory cold water game fish. And and immediately I began to fish the Towie particularly a lot more. But I also um, I I went up and I fished the Typhi with a very young Stephen Jones. Um, And I mean, Stephen was a kid then but he was working as a fishing guide. And it was obvious to me when I met him that I thought this kid knows, he knows his stuff. Age is irrelevant with, you know, it's the same as with football. If they're good enough, they're good enough. And, I, and I've, I've met several young people who I've learned a lot from, you know. So Stefan was one of them. And uh, we, we had great nights on the Tyve, And then I went on the Towie and fished there. In fact, and then the Clevi fishing with Tony, um, particularly Tony Davis, trying to chase mullet on the fly, some of the biggest mullet I've ever seen in that river. That's another challenge. Um, so I, I think it really took off in that period between bonefish permit and then going into cold water game fish. And, and when I came to Norway, uh, it's very difficult to describe, really, but I, I just felt I'd come home. I, I I can't say it any other way than that. I'm quite happy here. I mean, I, I'm I'm a rough ass black country lad, you know, on the hinterland between the black country and Birmingham. I love football. I love Saturday afternoons. I love going to the match, the smell of it, the pies. You know, um, I, I love I love many many things about Britain, but. I feel at home here. I always have. I came and, um, you know, because uh, of a love really of, of the place more than anything. I, um, th- there's a classic joke. I came here, I met Anna Marit, my wife, who who is uh, just, um, she's the one who's really tamed me without actually caging me up. And that was the key, really. She... She, she supported everything I've done and she's never tried to cage me. And because of that, she succeeded in keeping me very close to home. But people make a joke about um, 
uh, you know, about the uh, about the, the 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 daughter of the landowner um, uh, with you know uh, part of the Gowler River, which you know, which part of that don't don't you like? You know, there's always been this joke that um, it's 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 the classic one, isn't it? Of um, you know, you look in in the newspaper and you put an advert in where you you know you're looking for uh, you're looking for a wife. And um, with a stretch of river, please send picture of stretch. You know, it's 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 that uh, syndrome. So there were many Danes and many Swedes who who absolutely loathed and tested me when I got together with Honor Marie, and still do um, because of that. Because I thwarted a lot of ambitions there. Um, uh, but you know, honestly, mate, it's not. That's not it. I I can I've always been able to black some fishing if I want it. I can fish anywhere in the world if I want to. Honestly, I can. Um, that's not it. Having the river now, Gowler is. I do feel very bound to it, and I I I feel very passionate about trying to preserve it for future gen- generations. But when I came out here. I genuinely wasn't looking for any sort of new relationship. I certainly wasn't looking to move to Norway or into Scandinavia, um, but that's what happened. And with Gowler, to tell you the truth, salmon fishing isn't my favourite form of fly fishing. I would probably put sea trout, as I've said to you before, and brown trout on, on certainly on dry flies and emerges ahead of salmon. As something to do. I do love salmon um, and I love catching salmon, but there's a lot of dull moments in between uh, with salmon fishing. You know, you, you can go down a salmon river and fish a pool through. And if someone says to you, um, you know, what, what would you, what would you do differently? When you realize that you probably wouldn't have done anything differently um then you realize how frustrating salmon fishing can be uh it, it sometimes it's a game of chance there are things that you can do to tip to tip the balance there are some people who are better at salmon fishing than others and we can talk about that if you want because i've seen a lot of fishing yeah. Matt, I think it would be really, really interesting, if possible, to get some of those tips then from what you see of somebody who's on the river a lot. What sort of advice would you um, give people about their salmon fishing? Well, th- one of the reasons why I believe that um, dry fly fishing and emerger fishing for brown trout is more skillful than salmon fishing is because there is a key. Uh, if you can work out what the fish are feeding on and at what stage of the, the haps there, you, you know, and then you can provide a fly that imitates that. There is no finer school to follow in, ter- in, in pure fishing terms. To, to understand entomology, to understand hatches, to understand that unlike um, stocked fish, Wild fish are driven by wild instincts. So a wild fish is worth 10, 20, 30 stockies. I came to recognise that years and years ago. Um, And, you know, there's no doubt about it. There are plenty of people who are skillful who fish for rainbow trout. But in my league of uh, merit, it's quite low. Wild fish are where it's at. But I realise that there aren't. Not everybody can fish for wild fish. It's a tremendous privilege. So with brown trout, I think that is the ultimate school. If you want to become the ultimate fisherman, my advice is you end up there. You don't start there, but you end up there. But with salmon fishing, there is this rogue element where you can fish wonderfully. You can choose the right fly. You can cast perfectly and still not catch a fish if there is not a taking fish in that pool you ain't going to catch it so salmon are one of the most frustrating of of all fish really because you can't you can't force them into something 
with a trout, you know, you can tempt it to some extent. I mean, perhaps with the salmon, yes, if you, you know, you put a fly down deep and stick it in its face, you might get an aggressive reaction. But, you know, I think people often invent narratives about what's happened after the event. They do it in course fishing. They'll say, oh, yeah, I was casting on that gravel bar. There's no gravel bar there. They, should, you know, think, they think there is. And I think that happens with salmon fishing. Oh, yeah, I put on one of these and I did that and then, uh, you know, that really works. I, I, I honestly believe that salmon fishing is largely – largely a game of chance now on rivers like this one which is not easy um it doesn't suffer fools gladly here gala fish like a fly fished at speed much faster than you'd fish it in scotland these fish are genetically you know very powerful very used to cold water uh, incredibly robust, and th they like a fish going, uh, a fly going quite quickly. Um, and you need to cast well generally to catch fish consistently on this river. You need to cast well. If you don't, you just won't catch many fish. But once you reach a certain level, I believe there aren't that many things that you can do. But what can you do to improve your chances? One of the biggest influences on my fishing career in salmon fishing is, is Laurie Hickman. I mean, Laurie was a very successful match fisherman in course fishing, but also uh, caught many, many salmon. And in fact, one of the things which always amused me about Laurie was I said to him, so, so you match fishing during the weeks. He fished for the Daiwa team. He was really good. He was on the fringes of the England team, mates with Ivan Marks and Roy Marlowe and all the rest of them. And... Um, but at the weekend, he used to go, so I'm fishing. I said, well, how did you, you know, it's an interesting social sort of mix there. How did you manage that? He said, oh, it was easy. I bought a pipe and a cravat. Uh, but, but he said, I, <laughs> I had to give up the pipe in the end because it kept burning my tongue. Uh, and, and I love Laurie because he's, he's always been honest with me. And we were fishing once. We were on the D at Park, I think. Was it at Park? Anyway, it was snowing. And I remember that day I caught a salmon in the snow, which I really, it was great. I've got a picture of it, you know. But anyway, there was a fish shown on the far side under this tree. It was quite a long throw. And I couldn't quite get there most casts. Occasionally I'd get to it, you know. Laurie came wandering along the bank and he said, um, he watched me for a bit. And then we went back to the hut at lunchtime. He said, yeah, how are you getting on? I said, uh, oh, the, you know, this fish. He said, oh, what? She said, so you, you need to learn to cast within your limits, mate. And uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're trying to cast too far. He said, you can't cast that far. Therefore, your presentation isn't very good. And, and years later, or a couple of years later on the gala, I began to realise how true that is. Because you want that fly to start swimming the minute it touches the water. Gala fish, bang, they'll have it. And quite often, as it touches the water, as it turns over, wallop. You think, how have they seen that so quick? How have they caught that fly so quick? But what you don't want in your setup is a load of slack. You don't want a, a fly that's wafting around. No good. That fly needs to hit the water and start swimming. So he was right. I was trying to cast further than I could. Now, yes, I could make the cast fairly easily. But at the end of the day... You have to fish within your limits. So that's my first piece of advice to people. Fish within your limits, fish neat, fish with the line stretched out. Secondly, fish quietly. Don't treat salmon like um, a clumsy big fish. Salmon are just as wary as trout or any other salmonoid species. They're wild fish. They've come into the river after you know a year or two spent at sea. They're not used to footfall. They're not used to disturbance. They're not used to things standing over the top of them. And since they were par, they've instinctively uh, learned to avoid moving shadows, flash, anything that, you know, it's just instinctive. So I think approaching the water with a bit of respect <clears throat> and a little bit circumspect on the first run down the pool. Have a quiet run down. Fish gently before you go in with the sun ray and try and smash it to the other side. And then I think the third thing, especially in low water, 
don't have concrete boots. Uh, people who have concrete wading shoes rarely do well in salmon fishing. Fish through the pool quickly. It's very, very important that you do. And in low water, you want to be taking seven or eight steps between casts. Because on this river, the water's so clear, Pete. You know, the fish, I've filmed flies underwater. The fish can see your fly from, from oh, 20, 30 metres away at times. I mean, don't kid yourself. So by the time it arrives in front of them, they've seen it about 10 times. Yeah. They, know, they know that it's not the right thing. But if you take a lot of steps, the chances are that it will come as a surprise. Because my obsession with salmon fishing, really, or I believe that the key to salmon fishing is the illusion of life. That the fish sees the fly at the last minute. and that drives everything. It drives how many steps you take between casts. It describes how quickly you fish the fly, but it also describes your choice of fly pattern. Now, Laurie Hickman said to me in those early days, he said, mate, he said, there isn't a salmon I've come across on the planet that won't take a willy gun. It might be a tube. It might be a double. Think about it. Willy gun is the perfect salmon fly. For a start off, it mixes all the great salmon fishing colours. But the point is it mixes them. So if you're fishing a willy gun with a stacked wing, say a modern temple dog with, you know, your yellow, your orange and your black. Some people like a bit of red in there. If it's a stacked wing, that, that's not a willy gun. A willy gun is a mixture of fibres. So when you put it in the water, it's quite hard to see one individual colour because the contrast is mixed. You've got light, medium and dark fibres in a willy gun. Now you can control that. If you want the fly to be darker, to show up more in coloured water or whatever, or in the evening, put a few more dark fibres in if you want to. But the point is, that the willy gun is a fly that mixes contrast. So the salmon can't see it well. They can see it at the last minute, but they can't see it good. And to me, that principle, we use lots of flies here on Gap. We use a lot of green flies. Why do we use green flies? Why is, you know, Norway the only place in the world where green salmon flies work really well? Because of the tint in the water. Gowler is, the, the old word for gowler comes from gul, which means yellow, yellow river. Well, yellow green chartreuse is a, a true uh, if reflection. But the fly choice that we use on this river, when the river's low, especially early season, it, it, if it has a tint, it's, it's a yellow green. When the water rises in the autumn and we get lots of the forest runoff come in and debris, it has a browner, more whiskey type tinge. Then we often use flies with brown and orange. Um, and it's all about playing with contrast. If the water's clear, you want the fly to blend in as much as possible to reflect the hues of the water so that the fish see it at the last minute. If the water's dirty, they've got to be able to see it. And the water will camouflage to some extent. So you get away with higher contrast flies like black and yellow, black and orange. But to me, that, that's the key to salmon fishing. Everything lies in what folk has described as if a fish could speak, it would say, what was that? Not, there it is. And, and if you keep that in here, it drives how you tie flies, what, what, what type of flies you use how you fish them, the speed at which you fish them, it drives everything. So the key with salmon is the illusion of life. Yeah, yeah. And do you play with They're, sizes all that? Do I what, sorry? Size of flies. Do you change size of flies much or do you stay pretty constant? I do. I do change. I mean, you know, we start typically sort of early season. Um, we start, actually, I might have somebody sent me something the other day. Um because we, we, we do, 
have flies here for our guests. But um, yeah, I mean, let's have a look here. What have I got? The, these these here are very typical sort of gowler flies. These are yellow green sort of colours. That's about a medium sized tube. Pretty good all year round. Not not so not so great sort of early season. And then oh, I'm to see if we've got something else. Yeah, these are these are a bit more. Um night fly. Black. I've asked a tire to do some of these weeks. So I, I tie flies, but I can't I can't tie them quick enough. <laughs> um to <laughs> no, it's two actually. Uh, is it is is a willy, mix fiber willy gun here? So that that would be a small early season fly for us, and that's a traditional willy gun. But more typically, we're using probably four, five, even six inch temple dog style flies, black and green, black yellow, uh, black yellow and green. Um, sometimes with a bit of blue in as well if we've got some fresh fish in. Um, and then by the time we come to the middle part of the season, you know, um, we're probably on flies more of that sort of size, which is what, probably about three three inches, something like that, two and a half to three inches. And then by the time we come to the end of the season, um, we'll be down on wee doubles. And, you know, if the gowler's really low, uh, we'll be using something like, now, the interesting thing about this fly uh, is this fly's got some bling in it. I don't like lots of flashing the flies. I think it puts the fish off, but it's got a bit, this one, this temple dog here. This one's got none. Hmm. And it's also got earth tone colors. It's a, Mar it's a March brown double. That's what it is. It's got a hare's ear body, and it's got a traditional... Doubled wing, very difficult to tie paired wings. Very difficult. If, you, if you're a fly tie, you know that that is the holy grail. If you can tie really tie really good classic wet flies, you've cracked it. You're as, you're as good as anybody. But what what we tend to do in the summer is start the season. We're using four to six inch uh, temple dog tubes. Um, a lot of black, yellow, and green. If the water comes up and, and it's got any dark colour in it, then yes, we'll we'll look at black and orange uh, or pure black is my advice in the flood. One, one of those two. Um, but usually it flies with green in them, black and green in them. Then we get into the mid-season. We're still using a lot of banana-type flies to blend in with the tint in the water. But by this time, we'll be down to like two, two and a half inches um, maximum. When we come to August, well, we're on, on very small tubes, micro tubes, small doubles, as I showed you there, 12s, 14s. Um, and, of course, you can never rule out a sunray shadow. Um, <laughs> you should always have some of those in your box. But a, a really interesting fly that I've used in the last couple of years is a fly that I call a half arse, which is – Basically, a sunray with a shorter wing, but no flash in it at all. Um, and just bland. So when the fish have seen a lot of stuff, don't use flash. Just use earth tone coloured flies, flies that blend in. It, it's the same principle, Pete. It's the illusion of life, mate. The fish has got to see the fly, but you want to, it to see it at the last minute. If the water's coloured, it will see it at the last minute. Because of the colour in the water, everything's more confused. There's leaves going down and you know, there's more turbulence. But in clear water, you, it, it's the illusion of life. I'm telling you. Nice tip. I'm convinced that's the key. Nice tip. Seeing those small flies reminded me of a piece um, Tom Clinton wrote for our magazine, Fly Culture, about they all came out with Alex Jardine to visit you and fish with you, with Toby Merrigan. There was a... Um, Rob Thomas, I think they were all over, all, all the bad boys. And um, it was incredibly low, but then the rain came and it was just an amazing, it turned out to be a phenomenal, phenomenal trip. 
and there's a picture of them looking over the bridge and counting all the salmon in the pool below. Said it was absolutely fantastic. Yes, I, we, we love those guys. They um, they call themselves the Rainbows, and um, uh, Tom. He, well, they're all great. They're all great lads, and I, I love having them here. They bring some youth and vitality to it because you know a lot of our customers are, uh, you know, like me, a bit getting on a bit. But um, I love. I love their enthusiasm. I like spending time by the river with them. And it's so nice um, to get young folks here. It's, it's all part of the the sort of the culture of it, Pete. You know, it's the celebration of fishing. I love spending time by the water with them and seeing their enthusiasm. And they're good fishers. Um, they don't know everything. And on that trip, they needed a bit of uh, help from me. <laughs> and my gilly George, who uh, really looked after them. Um, but that was a classic case in point. You know, they, they went from the river being low and clear, utter despair. We we actually arranged for them to go down to the Stream River on the coast. And George, bless him, drove him down. And me and the missus, we uh, we picked up a motorhome, drove down with them, hired them a house. Because the problem was it was so hot. I thought, what can I I've got these guys coming. What can we do? You know, it's just disaster. Everything's too warm. And I thought, well, glacial river, glacial river. You could catch fish on a glacial river. So I arranged for them to have a couple of days trout fishing um, on this beautiful crystal clear river. Um, and we drove down there with them. I cooked them curry at night. I remember that for about 12 people. Never cooked for 12 people before. Um, but I figured they were young and foolish and they wouldn't care even if it tasted like, you know. So um, I cooked for them. And then George took them on. Um, sorry about that awful noise outside, by the way, Pete. We're, one of the farmers is ploughing the fields, everybody, if you can hear a bit of rumbling. Yes, yeah, so then we took the guys down to um, the stream, or George did. And while they were down there, I, I saw the weather forecast and I phoned them up and I said, look, lads, I think by Thursday night or Friday morning, this river is going to be game on. So I phoned them as soon as it started raining. I just knew and I said, you better get back up here. So they packed everything away and came straight back. And thankfully it worked because between, between the Friday afternoon, I think, a couple of them I managed to persuade it to stay until the Tuesday because we actually weren't fully booked the next week. And I said, look, just stay if you can, because the fishing is going to be absolutely amazing. And I, I forget how many fish they caught between that Friday. And I mean, one of them, um, Toby, I think he, he, he caught his last fish about 10 minutes after he should have been off to the airport. So it was a great trip. And, and the, the fly then was Fatagorva, yeah. which is brown and black. There was brown in the river. And I remember some of them hadn't got fatagorvas, so I tied them. Fred hadn't got any fatagorvas. He was going, oh, the lads have caught fish. And I said, don't worry. And I remember tying him two fatagorvas. And in the next two hours, I think for three hours, he caught three fish. But that salmon fishing, mate, you know, it's what I'm trying to say. You, you can't force it like other sorts of fishing. If the conditions are good, make hay while the sun shines. If they're bad, you know, you, you you better have a passion for yeah. whiskey or that's just something. I'll tell you what's really interesting, though, that you've brought out from that and what comes out to me as you talked about the fishing, but also being a good host and looking after your guests. The fishing's tough. You're not going through the, the motions. You're finding fishing for them. You're looking after them. You're tying the flies for them and then getting them on the fish as well. And that's that's a really important part i guess of being a host as well and can easily be overlooked i guess can't it yes i mean look as, as a host you, you you can't you can't change the form of the river it's beyond your influence the only thing that you can influence is the quality of the service and the level of knowledge that you've got now i I get lots of people come here, uh, you know, a lot of people, some of the Scandi guys that come, you hear rumours in the valley, they're all casting champions, all of them. 
They've all won this and won that. I mean, it's impossible, mate. There aren't enough championships going, but anyway. So these these hot hot shots come down. The, the reason that they catch so many fish is they're good. They do cast, I mean, in comparison to our um, British clients, uh, the Norwegians and the Swedes are much better casters, much, much better. Um, and, of course, they understand the subtle differences between salmon fishing in the UK and over here where generally, you know, the fish want to fly faster. And there's a lot of 24 hours a day fishing here. Um, and it's that. They just fish. They just bomb the water to bits and they're just fishing and fishing and fishing and fishing and they're relentless. And so I... I really don't want to run a fishery. I don't run a fishery for those people. There are places on the river where they can go and fish. But my customers, our customers, I think we've got all sorts. Of course, we've got some red-hot fishermen that can, that come here um, regularly. And they're really, really good, but they fit in. They fit in. They get on with the other people. They're not trying to pull strokes on them all the time because I won't allow it. It's as simple as that. Um, the way I run the fishing here is the way I would like to experience it myself. And yes, we 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 want people here of a certain culture, of a certain mentality, which is people who will mix, people who enjoy the magic, who will share their knowledge with others celebrate with other people when they catch a fish and commiserate when they lose one. That's the atmosphere here. There's magic here in the summer. It crackles. There's magic. It's been going since 1882. It's an unbelievable place. It's like Hotel California. You check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And I never did. Um, and, you know, me and Honor Marie, we, 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 we there is an element of destiny in it. It's what we do. I don't do it for money, I can tell you that. I don't personally have any money out of it. We do it because the family have done this for a long time. And the river, it, ne it, needs, it needs people who care about it, Pete. It does. So, for example, um, to try and even the odds, I had two American fellas came a couple of years ago, and I can tell you lots of stories like this, and they were steelhead fishermen. They'd never been fishing for Atlantic salmon before in their lives. And I knew that the river was at such a height. It was in flood, actually. But I knew that the fish in our home pool would be very close to the bank, and it would suit these guys. So I said, when they got here, I said, we got their stuff together. I said, lads, have you fished for salmon? No. I said, OK, listen. Normally, I'd spend some time exploring, you know, the theory of salmon fishing and trying to acquaint you with the theory of what you've got to do. But what I want you to do now is get down to that river, get to that pool that I've just showed you, start fishing. I'll bring the dog in a minute. I'll make you some coffee. Just start casting. I said to the, to, to the lad, I said, can you get 15 yards out, 20 yards? He said, yeah. I said to his father-in-law, Joe, can you do that? Yes. I said, OK, go and fish the way I described to you. As I arrived at the pool, the young guy, on his first cast, was playing a 20-pound salmon. Or well, he just put it back, actually. They literally just releasing it. And th that, that, that knowledge and certainty, of, of that only comes with time by the water and with a certain amount of experience at the river. But I want those people to have just as good as an experience as all the hot shots. I know the hot shots can catch fish. They don't need my intervention. There's not that much that I can teach them, to be honest. So I tend to enjoy their company and try and learn a little bit from them. But the people who are lesser mortals, who don't have as much time to spend on fishing, they're the ones where I can tip the balance. And so that's what I try to do. And one of the things that we do here where we I've said you can't force salmon fishing, but the truth is that, that there is something that we do that helps. And that is that we have resting periods here. I won't allow people to flog the water 24 hours a day. So in June and July, I close the river twice a day for four hours at a time. 
and I get everybody off the water. But what's interesting, Pete, is me and Anna did the stats. Over 75% of our fish are caught after a resting period. The enforced ones. No one else on the river does it. And that's why if you come to the Gowler River, if you're any good, you've got a good choice of where to go. If you're not that good, come here. Nice. Lovely. Matt, it sounds... No, no, no. They'll chew you up and spit you out, Matt. I'm mm. not joking, they will. Because these guys, they've got an engine that you can't compete with unless you, certainly you're in your 20s or early yeah. 30s. They're mad. Yeah. They're raving mad. They're, they're, because in Scandinavia, you've got to understand, you know, they always say we'll sleep in the winter. And they mean that. But we run a fishery for everybody. And we're, we've got many, many Scandinavian customers that come here and really, really enjoy it. But we... We tend to attract people of a certain way of thinking. And I expect our experienced anglers to muck in, help out, and, you know, just be part of the part. Of the party. And, uh, and they are. They're wonderful. The trouble is they all become friends. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you know. It's hard to have a business mentality yeah, when they're yeah, all that's, that's Absolutely fantastic. You've got me, the gal has been on my list, and it's got me chomping at the bit, and I'm going to come knocking at, at some stage as well. I know that. Um, if people who are listening to this, and I think, you know, the way that you run the lodge and the fishing and the, the fish are not just a product for people to go catch, it's quite clear you care about those deeply as well hence the resting and everything else that goes with it but if people want to come and um fish with you out there how do they get in touch with you well uh the, the place is called wind's nest fly fishing lodge um the house here the big house where we house our guests um was built in 1882 and in that year the first overseas fishers came john gordon and his party um, Gordon was fishing in, in this valley from, from, I think, about the late 1850s to 1860. So he was here a long time. In 1882, the Winsness family moved out of the original Winsness, Winsness farm and split the property, literally moved parts of it, including uh, parts of the buildings here. But they built a new house called Storstu, which means big house, um, in 1882. And the first time a fisherman stayed here then. So it's been going on. Uh, a very long time if you want to find us just look for Winsness fly fishing lodge on facebook that's where you get the most up-to-date info we have got a website called gowlersalmon.com um but for all the sort of latest info info Winsness fly fishing lodge and if on either the website or on the facebook page you hit the contact us button it will come through to me or and or on a Murray and um she tends to deal with the bookings. I tend to deal with the fishing questions and, you know, the, the management of the fishery, um, which, you know, we're very lucky. We've got four kilometres of water, which are all in, in, in a row. So there are places on Gowler which have got slightly more water than us in some cases, like Norwegian fly fishers, for example. But ours is one continuous length, both banks. And that is, that's a rare thing on Gowler. But it's a wonderful thing because we've probably got, for fly fishing anyway, I can't think of any water that's really better. And I'm biased, of course, but it is. It's it, it, it's like if you if you ask a, a golfer to design a, a pro golf course, you know, the bunker would be there and the fairways. Be, that This Salmon River, this part here is built for fly fishing. But there are some very other good places you can go, particularly – um, you've got Norwegian fly fishers um, who operate um, not far away from us. And, you know, we, we got on really well. I get on well with Pear and, and the guys that work down there, um, uh, Daniel and Tees. Uh, you know, they're good, good people. And they believe in many of the si similar things to us. Um, you've got um, uh, Uni Roja running um, Gala Fly Fishing Lodge, for, mainly further down, but he's got some water above the Galfoss. Um, close to Sturin, um, good fishing operation. Um, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit flippant when I say come to us, but um, certainly my, my advice is 
that you want to make sure if you're coming to fish the gala that there's no fishing on the far bank that there's no spin fishing if you're a fly fisherman that's very important so do you do you know do your due diligence before you book because i've had, i've spoken to many people who've had wonderful experiences on this river but i've spoken to people who've had horror stories as well um no no excuse for not doing your homework with the tools available to you now use facebook and and you know Use Google. Matt, thanks very much for that. We've we've covered so much and there was so much more I wanted to ask you, but I'm going to end with one last question. Would you change anything? No. No, mate. No. Not one second. Yes, of course, hindsight's a great thing. I might I, I might have uh, conducted myself better in perhaps in certain relationships and left less of a trail of devastation in my wake at times. But really, nah, it's been brilliant. I, uh, Peter, I've lived the dream. I really have lived the dream. I mean, you know, you can't be ungrateful for that, can you? I've gone with the stream. I'm still going with it. I don't know where I'll end up. That's the thing. I think I'll be here. I'm pretty sure I'll be here. But, you know, that's been the thing. Uh, never say never, they say. And and um, you never know where that stream's going to take you. It's, it's shaped my life. I'm, I'm really seriously contemplating writing a book at the moment called Going With The Stream about my life because I came across a load of transparencies, um, slides of the days of yore um, the other day um, when I was clearing out my house in the UK. And I've got thousands and thousands of transparencies so i'm going to scan them restore them in lightroom and you know like retouch them all and then make them you know part of of this book that i'm gonna create P- possibly in two parts possibly splitting the course fishing and the fly fishing years because some I, I think great fishermen do do a bit of both but it's not a large number of people so your book publisher is not going to particularly want to kind of mix the metaphor so much i don't know i'll have a think but i I will do the book it it probably will be called going with the stream and it will be about brilliant brilliant well i'd like to thank you as i said for the tv programs and it has been the soundtrack of my daughter growing up and she's a bit older now but we used to as i said genuinely watch them all i can remember so many of them so i'd like to thank you for that and i'd also like to obviously thank you for being a guest but being so open about everything that you talked about it's been really really fascinating listening to you matt so thank you so much for that it's a pleasure sir and uh please pass on my best to your daughter because you know Fishing is changing. There's a lot of women coming into fishing at the moment, and it's a very, very healthy thing, that is. It's a very broad church fishing. It's the one thing I know where it doesn't matter what politics you are. It doesn't matter what sex, background, uh, what football team you support, uh, what the colour of your skin is. None of those things matter. All that matters is that you feel at peace when you've got that piece of carbon and cork in your hand and uh long may it be so. matt hayes thank you so much You're thanks welcome, everyone for listening to the fly culture podcast i hope you'll enjoy this one as much as i have done it's been absolutely fabulous so we've got plenty more plans so tune in soon to listen to the fly culture podcast the fly culture podcast is brought to you in association with fly culture a quarterly print magazine For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.